urbanization. I mean, with, uh, uh, I will build on that in, in following slides. It's a huge problem, and uh, we all know why. You are facing some of, of these problems already in terms of, uh, let's say, just traffic or environment or housing. And it's going to grow rapidly. Uh, globalization simply means that uh, uh, communication is much quicker. People travel a lot faster. So whatever is happening in one part of the world is ac accessible to you almost instantly. You traveled here, I think it was like 10 hours altogether, maybe a bit more with uh, changing flights. That was not possible like 30, 50 years ago. Not on that scale and not that easy anyway. Okay. okay. Oh, well, let's, just, let's just leave it. Nobody's walking, so we'll ask somebody to come and clean it up later. Thanks. Um, and this uh, exchange of information, which is basically on click, you send information, you can see it in China. A few seconds travel of information from here to there. Uh, is going to in increase. Travel times are going to increase. Technology will enable this, as it is enabling what we have now. Uh, climate change. Well, I don't need to say much about that, except, uh, but I will just outline what is well, perfectly clear already. Uh, growing cities, congestion in cities without proper management will bring new problems. It will simply scale up. Currently, there are 7 billion people living uh, 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 in the world. Almost, well, half of that population is already in cities. It is just going to grow. So these are mega trends. There is another one, but I will leave it for a bit later. Um, so, as I said, majority of cities live in, pop uh, uh, majority of population already lives in cities, lives in urban environments. And I would just like to show how it actually um, progressed. This is 1970. It's like 45 years ago. So you have some centers. You can see United States and there's uh, Japan. These are 10 million or more locations. This is also very, very of course, important, 5 to 10 million. You will see uh, because how it simply grew in a period of 20 years. So there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten locations with over 10 million people. And many more orange ones all over the place. Then we get to today. That's 24 years later, basically, last year, 2014. And what is expected by 2030? That just indicates the scale of the problem we have. And 2030 is like 15 years from now. We will be all up and running still. And given, as I said, how technology is developed, a um, health issue might be less of a problem, and it's, uh, life could be extended, or will be extended. As, as a matter of fact, it is, it is happening. Health technologies and, and techniques and, and many other things. So I would like to compare this with, uh, with global gro growth. I couldn't really find uh, uh, this uh, nice picture in uh, uh, 1970, but let's take it from 80. It's all more or less the same. Japan, as if you remember, has two dots, urban cities over 10 million, and the US had one dot. So uh, if you take a look, this is, a, this is a proportion, and share of the world growth in emerging countries is 31%, compared to advanced countries, 69%. Then we go to 1990s. Well, US is shrinking. Japan is shrinking significantly. Germany and Italy are off the chart. Who's growing? Well, Japan, India. Mm -hmm. huh? Oh, Japan, sorry. Japan is shrinking significantly, that is what I said. Just before I said Japan is growing, so sorry about that. And then we go to 2002, 2007, US still shrinking, China still growing, India growing, Japan is shrinking, Canada, Canada is out of the picture. Indonesia, oh, 
So somehow, already in, no, somehow, the 2002-2007 emerging country had 67% of, of uh, uh, share of world growth. 2012-2017. The trend continues. U.S. kind of stabilized, but uh, UK is out of the picture. Japan is still shrinking. Russia is uh, falling down. India and China are growing. So if you try to compare with the map where the uh, uh, urban agglomerations are growing rapidly, you can easily match that these are actually the areas where this growth is happening. But what is worrying that some of areas on the global map are not growing despite the fact that they are having lots of those red dots. So I don't see any, any African country or Africa mapped on global growth chart at all. Which means that something, there is a huge concentration of people which are not being utilized properly. That's my personal conclusion. Maybe the environment is not supportive to, to, to develop capacity, people, in the first place. So, this is where the role of cities is actually quite important. I hope I managed to illustrate this uh, because uh, we, will, we will go on. And when we talk about competition between cities, and uh, it's, it's uh, about tourists, it's about uh, economy, and it's about people. But one fundamental, uh, <coughs> one very important uh, thing to look at are actually talents and talented people, individuals. So this potential has to be built, and how, uh, uh, but that may not be enough. You have to also think how to uh, uh, work in, uh, in a much broader global environment to attract people. That is possible, but you have to create environment. You have to invest in proper things to make your city attractive and mapped on a global scale. And that simply means that you cannot simply say, Okay, we will, uh, do, we will be great. You have to be precise about what, in which area you will excel, which brings us to, to the need to specialize, to think uh, what your uh, uh, upsides, what your uh, uh, advantages as a city are. And people, uh, uh, cities are, are competing more and more, and what they're doing is they're creating uh, uh, infrastructure that enables better quality of life that enables better communication with people. It creates environments where people can uh, actually uh, accomplish themselves, where they can uh, bring their ideas uh, to other people. The trend before was basically, I have an idea, I don't want to share it because you might steal it from me. This is not the case anymore. Technology changed that. If you have an idea, somebody else had it before you. It's just a matter of whether you're capable enough to bring it to the market and capitalize on it, whether you can actually convert your idea into, into value. And this is another trend which is extremely important, and that's uh, exponential growth of knowledge and technology. It grows extremely quickly. I don't know if you, you probably remember that uh, Technology like iPad that most of us now have, some tablets and touchscreen smartphones, this was not possible like six, uh, let's say seven years ago. It was not there. We were seeing that on, on, on Star Trek, like watching uh, sci-fi shows. Today it's reality, it's possible. And what this simply means that the time from one uh, uh, invention or, or one uh, um, well technology leap to another is just shortening and here we have such a huge progression so many things simply piling up this was a printing printing press and this is a telescope it took, took 200 years to get from printing press to telescope for instance and now we are looking at uh, 3D chips, which will completely change the way uh, 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 computers process uh, 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 information and bring more processing power just a couple of years from now. 
So it's extremely important trend, and that is essentially, on one side, big problem, and on the other side, huge opportunity. It's a problem because uh, things are moving so fast, you always have to be careful to be on forefront. You have to think about how to capitalize on new ideas or build on existing ones. You have to think how to combine existing technologies to create new value, to address new issues. You don't have to invent new things, but you have to be creative about how to use and apply uh, what is around you. If you don't do that, you may actually face uh, well, doom, downfall. I will, I, will, uh, build, I will try to explain this on the other slide. But the opportunity, on the other hand, is extremely big. Because the question, these developed countries are so advanced, can we catch up? Is becoming less and less relevant. Because new technologies are emerging, and you can always build on something new that's uh, uh, out there. So it's just a matter of having proper setup and working into, well, if you want, global networks in partnerships. Because your own resources will never be enough. But if you combine your resources, then you can actually speed up the processes also, also in, in your own countries. So, as it says here, uh, We are now accomplishing in one year what took centuries in ancient history. In one year. And it will speed up. The smartphone that you have in your pockets, I think all of you have it. Correct me if I'm wrong, but um, does, is there somebody, someone who doesn't have a smartphone? You're not going to tell you. Yeah, they're embarrassed. Huh? <laughs> Children in, in, uh, in elementary school have smartphones. It's ridiculous, but they do. It's a fancy thing to have, and it's affordable. Well, not to everybody, but uh, some parents can afford it. It's, it's, it's insane, but this is the reality, and we have to live with it. This will change the patterns of our behavior. It already changed the patterns of our behavior. It will have to change how we think about the future, how we think about education. For kids, first and foremost. Because it's not about teaching kids uh, what happened in which year. You can Google that now, from any place in the world. It's not basically about information. It's about how you process information. What conclusions you derive on your own. That is what is important. So basically, when we talk about education, I could go on on that as well, but if you talk about it, maybe the main point is, we need to learn uh, uh, and teach well, children how to learn. Because learning is an exercise that will follow them until the rest of their lives. Same as us. We are here to learn. Including me, including well, everybody. If you're not learning then, well, then you have a serious problem. So, uh, where is the danger? Of, of this progression of technology. Well, in 1994, Motorola was world leader in analog mobiles, a huge market share. Seven years later, well, they rapidly fell. Nokia took over with digital mobile phones. It happened very quickly. Seven years is almost nothing. And these are big companies. And then, well, Nokia also failed. So what happened? What happened is that they were not really thinking about the market in a proper way. They were focused more, I would say, uh, I hope you can correct me if I'm wrong, um, probably no more than, uh, about that than me. But uh, um, what happened is that they were focused more on, on research and trying to, to develop product to perfection. They didn't launch it on the market, so didn't, they didn't get customer feedback. So they were holding it back. They had uh, touch screen technology before Apple. But Apple was, uh, 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 let's say, brave. They had a very interesting, innovative approach to marketing and branding. So they launched a very neat, slick, fancy device, which everybody was uh, willing to, well, 
say, okay, I want this even if something is not really working, but it worked perfectly. So everything was perfect with Apple device, and what happened is that they couldn't uh, basically after that roll out their own technology. And they spend huge amounts of money in technology that they never capitalized on. So there you go. So basically, this is, a, this is a, the thing with hyper-competition. Things move too fast, technologies and knowledge evolves too quickly, and you cannot afford to be average. You cannot afford to get stuck in commodity health. Because their profit margins are very small. Because everybody can do it. What you want to do is something that nobody is capable of doing, which brings you into a, a better position, where you can earn more money and reinvest in new developments and new products or, or markets. The optimal thing is to, well, pinpoint the area where there is no competition at all. It's called Blue Oceans, like Blue Ocean Strategy. If you, if you manage to do that, then you're alone on the market. But that needs to be managed. Sometimes uh, products and services or inventions emerge. But the point is to create environment where you will facilitate, facilitate that, uh, where, will, where you will organize it in a proper way so you have better chance of getting some new ideas and new uh, uh, solutions uh, available. Basically, basically it's, it's about uh, uh, managing it. I think that uh, in following presentations we will have more, uh, you will have more uh, and deeper insight in how it's done in technology parks and, and uh, incubators and with product. I'm just trying to set up a broader context here, so yeah. Uh, of course, you can stop me whenever you want if, uh, if uh, you have any questions. It's no problem. So I want I, to. Can I uh, actually sure. jump back? I just wanted to make a point about a slide you showed a little while back. Um, and I think it's important when you're talking to a certain audience, the one that talks about the cities where people would prefer to live. Let's go back to that. Okay. Because I think it's always important to contextualize this argument, any argument you're making here, from the perspective of Kenya, from the perspective of Nairobi, from the perspective of these managers. And I would bet that this, this survey, to me, uh, while those are, that's a wonderful list of cities, and of course, who would not want to live in any one of those cities? But I also know that, I'm, I'm guessing this survey was done um, on a very small group of fairly wealthy individuals in the global north. And um, I know plenty of people who are Africans who would love to live in Nairobi. <laughs> they say they would like to. So I just want to make it, I just want to point out that if you did the same survey um, at a, with a very diverse group of people, you might not end up with this same uh, list. And furthermore, the three cities you have at the top are the three most expensive cities in the world. And even if you'd like to live there, maybe, you can't, I, I couldn't even afford to live in those three cities. And so what I'm saying is I think this is a little distorted. And the principle is good, the logic, the concept is good, but I also think we need to keep in mind that there's different ways of surveying data and analyzing data. And a lot of times people would want to live in a city for different reasons other than the criteria um, that may have been mentioned in this particular survey. So sometimes cost of living, affordability is actually and a more important criteria than the absolute coolness and excitement of these cities. So don't get me wrong, I like a cool city, but at the same time I want to point out that we have to be very careful about how we use these, um, these surveys. Competition among cities is real. Nairobi will compete with probably most of these cities and others as well that are more similar or perhaps at a di th there may be an interesting way to, for us to look at which cities Nairobi is actually going to compete with. But certainly, um, these are some of them. And 
Furthermore, I wanted to add the issue of internal competition. You are not only going to be competing with other African cities, other global cities for your companies. You're also going to be competing with other Kenyan cities as well. So just wanted to add that kind of a little bit of nuance there. That is something I wanted to kind of get out of the way. Mm. Uh, thank you very much for this comment. It's, uh, of course, I agree with everything which, which you said. Uh, I will even build upon uh, the last comment about internal competition uh, uh, in part where I will touch upon smart specialization strategy. It's also basically about uh, organization on national level, how you position your cities to avoid uh, uh, competition and create synergies internally on a national scale. Because uh, each city will have to be precise about what they want to focus on, which means that they cannot capture everything, which means that there's more space for others. So there, it's a possibility, uh, there are possibilities there. Of course, it has to be properly assessed. I'm just uh, uh, talking about principles now. Mm -hmm. And the data that I had is basically, uh, uh, it's Boston Consulting Group uh, survey from 2014, of course, you're right. But I don't but have any survey. Of management consultants, basically. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Who are very, very elite. Okay. Yeah. Um, what might be a good idea is to create one such survey with uh, designed parameters for uh, assessing the position of uh, Nairobi or African uh, cities to, to see where they stand uh, uh, among each other. Or even, to, even better, to, to assess them in comparison to those cities. Because it's not only about competition with those cities. Sometimes it will be about partnership with those cities depending on the area that you select, depending on, on uh, what you want to build as, uh, uh, and, and utilize as your uh, future, well, let's say, uh, uh, well, how you want to position yourself, as a, uh, where do you want to excel? If, when you decide this, then you will, of course, look to other cities to partner up. Exponential growth of technology that will not allow you to do it on your own, because you will be too slow. So you have to build on ideas of others, as others will build on your ideas. It's partnership. Mm -hmm. And can I, I just want to ask you, you, all of you right now should know that Kenya is undergoing a review of the national urban policy. I bet many of you here have been asked to look at it, to review it. I'm sure Engineer Maya has been reviewing it. There, next week there will be a major workshop to look at the national urban policy that's being developed. And I'm re this is one of the things I've been working on, actually, is reviewing it. And the, the section on competitiveness needs to be developed based on some of these concepts that you're learning right here. So I urge you, as you participate in the review and the finalization of the Kenya national urban policy, to make sure that you take these concepts and carefully think through how these might be used to elaborate and fine tune your urban policy. Because I think this is taking it further. Uh, these concepts are taking it further and helping to elaborate some of the principles very well. well again, thank you for the comment. And it's going to be very important in the context of maintaining sustainable <coughs> economic growth. It's really important because simply we live in a global world. Maybe just a comment. Yeah, sure. How involved is the, the criteria for determining the competitiveness of status? And who are involved in developing these oh. criteria? It could be the West, it could be the very North. Because just by the looks of what I have there, really, I, I, I have my own doubts. Can I comment on that quickly? Yeah, sure. I think it's always difficult. You have to make a composite index. Yeah. And in a composite index of a number of factors, you need to decide how to weight them. And that is always different region to region. So there need to be several benchmarking, several comparison. Definitely one national, definitely one regional for, for Nairobi, Eastern Africa, and one global. And they may even need to be different depending on if we, if we benchmark for and compare for a visitor 
tourist industry, if we look at the industry, uh, business industries, or if we look at capital. So it's a very complex issue. I mean, maybe I, it comes back to the same thing. How in Vassal, I mean, even at that global level. Mm. You know, you know, in Vassal would mean, I want to imagine that uh, you, you know, there were urban specialists from areas like Africa who are involved in developing these people from European, North America, everywhere, everywhere. everywhere. Because we are really looking at a global scale. Mm -hmm. So that's what I'm asking. Mm. So uh, I will try to uh, make an example of uh, the case we uh, heard a couple of days back in that glass house. Where we talk, we're talking about energy, energy efficiency, waste management, for instance. And they showed a very neat system uh, Stockholm has to get waste through tubes to one point where then it's processed. And it was clearly said that this is not a solution that can be applied in your city. Therefore, you need to think about some other solution which you don't have now. And you not having that type of solution simply means that uh, 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 maybe you should look if somebody else in a similar situation as you have it. I doubt it. I doubt that there is a well-developed solution to, to handle and process waste in a proper way, uh, fitting to your local uh, city context. And there are many cities with the same problem. So what could be, let's say, I'm just improvising now, don't get me wrong. So what, uh, could be the idea to take this uh, uh, for, for assessment and analysis and figure out whether you can position yourself and set up uh, some sort of uh, unit uh, uh, or, or uh, education program with attached small research uh, center that can enable collaboration with those technology providers where you can build your own internal capacity and work on solutions to resolve your pressing issues of waste management in the city of Nairobi. If you come up with that solution, and that's a matter of research in the course of years, you can basically sell this solution, the design a business model, and sell it to other uh, cities with the same problem in the region. Therefore, you actually are in position to create a new business development out of the, uh, uh, let's say, circumstances that are not favorable to you now. And you're doing it by introducing technology, in, uh, bringing in uh, more educated people uh, with, of course, better salaries and basically lifting up the economy in this part of, of, um, of, of your work. So this uh, has to be very carefully thought through and has to be analyzed. And uh, of course, um, I cannot say now out of the hand if, if this is possible. We need to, it would be necessary to see what type of universities and capacity you already have along these lines, if you have any. So I, I don't know this, this given point of time, but uh, it can be uh, used as an example how you can actually lift up the economy, resolving your waste uh, uh, issues, and actually uh, lead the way for others in the region. Please. I, I think uh, maybe as we look at the growth of globally, we will also need to come up with the new perspective because uh, when I look at the global metro 2014, <coughs> it talks about two criteria. That is the yield growth GDP and uh, the employment. But that does not reflect on the, um, the, the urbanization in terms of people flowing into the cities, and, uh, and therefore, in terms of population, we find that the population is there, but when it is mentioned against the GDP and the employment, then most of the African countries will not be in that category. But in terms of growth, they are there. But I think that is the point, that's the point that has been driven here throughout the, the, the presentation. That, uh, um, uh, because got, in terms of economic efficiency, the African cities are behind because the, the, the urbanization does not translate to any GDP, GDP growth. And, and, and what he's saying is it's about people. If you invest in people, then you can change that. But again, you cannot also compete on everything. You must use your comparative advantage. What is it that you are good at? But you can't go for everything. You can't compete. That's not the best way to compete. Yeah. No, I'm talking about so, the, so, so the, the comparison in terms of 
you know, we must establish a criteria when we are talking about growth. What criteria are we using to measure that growth? And that's why we are saying when we measure it from the Global Metro 2014, they identified two criteria. And that was the GDP and the employment. But when you look at it now in terms of other criteria, you may find other cities also which may not be mega cities globally, but which in terms of population, now when you look at the population, they are even better. I mean bigger in terms of growth from where they were to where they are in 20. My point, my point is this. The constraint to development is distance and time. What technology is doing is to, is to do away with the barriers of distance and time. Now, cities are growing because they are able to... Capital is global. <coughs> so the decision that is made in New York can affect something in Nairobi because of that globalization. And Nairobi cannot escape from globalization process. It is part of that globalization. How do you compete? You cannot compete in New York with what New York, in anything that New York is doing good. But you must have an area where you have got comparative advantage. And, 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 and Dan, I was, I was going to uh, ask you, you did a, a recent presentation on the metropolization in Nairobi. And we were arguing on comparative advantages. And it's the same thing. You can scale it to a, a global level. When you were uh, in the minor, when, you were talk, when we last talk about globalization, uh, metropolization, we are talking about the cities within the counties. Each of them identify area where they have got comparative advantage, and that will be the focus of them enhancing their competitiveness. Okay. So the same thing you can, uh, you can put it at global scale. So in terms of the context has been put, it is for us now to develop what are the areas where we can. But you can't be on everything. And you don't have to depend on parameters somebody else designed for you. You can do it for yourself, yes. depending on what you want to achieve. So this is the, the thing. And uh, I mean... Uh, okay. Sorry. I would just like to comment on, on, on what you said. Absolutely right. And you cannot compete on everything because you don't have resources to do so. The resources have to go to what has the best potential to succeed. Where the biggest value is still the Okay. Um, okay, uh, thank you for this, this exchange. This is exactly uh, uh, what I want to achieve, to provoke uh, uh, a discussion. And this is what uh, brings best value for, for uh, presentations and, uh, like this. So, please. Now, I want to make some precisions on the, on the uh, definition of competitiveness. Competitiveness actually has a story. Uh, this was used by, uh, this was uh, formulated by, by a professor at Harvard Business School called Michael Pollan, and he designed this index. The big index uh, is just a, it's an aggregate of several indicators. It, 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 it includes uh, innovation, education, uh, legal framework, so many things. But how these indices are, 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 are compiled is through surveys. So in, in every country, they interview uh, leaders, political leaders, and, 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 and the business sector, and then they compile the index. And, and competitiveness uh, just, is just uh, a base for productivity. So when you talk about competitiveness, is how productive is the economy. And productive means that you have a certain level of labor and capital, and you combine, you combine this and you produce more. So that means, suppose everybody, every country in the world has the same level of capital and, and, and labor, and then the countries that with the same amount of capital and labor produce more, that means that that country is more productive and more competitive. Then there's a lot of discussion about if you can compare globally different cities. Actually, it's, uh, some people say it's irrelevant, because you cannot compare Kenya with, with, with the UK or, or, or US, because the base and the legal framework everything is very different. I think what is useful, so this, uh, this is interesting, you have to take into account when you discuss competitiveness in African cities. Okay. But you compare yourself with your neighbors, not, not with London, not, not with Paris, because you can use it as an as a, a, a anecdote. So it's a good story. But you compare, for example, if, if in the last 10 years, 
that is uh, Tanzania or Rwanda are doing better than you, then you have to worry. Because those, those cities that has uh, almost uh, uh, co uh, same comparative level of resources as you, they are combining the resources better than you. So that means, that means something is wrong. Or maybe you are doing better. I think uh, Kenya is doing, is doing uh, better than uh, several countries in, in, in the eastern part of Africa. Because you cannot compare with Egypt, with, with Morocco, those are also different stories. And, and, and so, so it's very important that, 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 that uh, you consider this because you are public officers. And one important point in terms of competitiveness is that you won't do everything. So the role that you, you have is to provide a good framework for the, for the private sector. That means yesterday we talked about mobility, right? Private sector won't do that. So you set the rules and you provide good mobility and you help all the economy to mobilize, uh, use multimodal transport and everything. So that's the role you provide. I, I, think, I think this has a strong effect <coughs> on, on competitiveness and productivity of African cities. Maybe why I was bringing it up is because uh, you know, one, one thing compares into another. You know, me, I look at competitiveness beyond the word competitiveness. I'm looking at uh, what we'd be calling as foreign direct investment. Mm -hmm. If a city is not competitive, who are these people who are going to come in with them? Mm -hmm. I mean, these are issues that uh, should, uh, should be at the back of our mind. Yes. So as we start talking about all this, I think issues relating to competitiveness is, is relevant to us globally, like it is to a certain London or or New York or somewhere else, isn't it? Mm -hmm. That's all I'm saying. Yeah. But we agree with the, with the, mm -hmm. with, with the way mm -hmm. it's being done. We were just getting concerned about uh, uh, the infrastructure, you know, how it was on. Uh, that is, mm -hmm. even how the infrastructure was developed by uh, a professor from maybe, maybe in our in American-based university. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. yes. Can I just recapitulate? It's very important to underscore, I think, what Marco has just said, that economic productivity, uh, financial um, risk, municipal management, uh, foreign direct investment is based on the investor's assessment of reliability that you are going to manage your urban functions well. And it may or may not have anything to do with where those business leaders want to live. They may like to live in a, they may want to invest in a place that they like to live, but let's be very clear. They want to invest in a well run, a place that's well run, well managed, in which the governance is strong and reliable. So let us be very clear that there is a difference between competitiveness in terms of personal lifestyle or desirability, and, which is still there, it's a component, don't get me wrong. But as Marco says, there's many different factors that will allocate economic resources <coughs> across the global field. You are now operating in a global arena, which is one of the key points here that you, you made. And at the same time, there are many, many factors that will dictate where that foreign direct investment, where that global capital will flow. And it's not just about where somebody wants to live. That's a fact. Yes. 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 Uh, thank you. Thank you for motivating this discussion. This is very interesting. I just want to say a story. A little story. Yeah. And the story is that uh, uh, a more productive economy means that they have a more complex, more complex economy. So they can produce more things. And there's an index uh, designed by a professor also, Ricardo Kaufman. And the more complex uh, country in the world is Japan. Because so they can produce more things. And, and that means some countries produce less, some countries more. Some countries have three levels. No, just three levels. You know this this game when you combine levels and and then you combine and you get more words. Some countries has only three levels. Some countries has uh, 20 levels. And so it has to be very realistic because this is important. When you bring somebody from Boston Consulting Group to a country 
in Africa who have many, many problems, many issues, like any other country in Latin America or, or, in, or, or in Southeast uh, Asia. Uh, then they say, uh, you go the next day, they are uh, impressed by the presentation, and they say, it's a country that is producing, probably is exporting uh, agricultural products. And the next day you go there and they say, look, you're a consultant, you come from, from overseas, uh, New York or Paris, so I, we need to be leaders in, in our technology. Okay, so now technology. You know how all the effort you have to invest in order to have a nanotechnology industry. But let's go back to Kenya. Kenya in this moment is exporting flowers. And exporting flowers is a very difficult industry. You are competing against uh, in, some, in, in some way with Netherlands, with Ecuador, with Colombia, who are leaders exporting flowers. And that means you have all a logistic system already in place to do this. So you don't have to go for the technology. If you if the government decides to go for the technology, it's making a mistake. Or it will cost a lot of money and it won't have the same productivity that other area. But you can do something very interesting. You already exporting flowers, then you can export avocado who is also difficult fruit to export. <coughs> and then you go going uh, leader by leader. The story is that if, you, if your economy is complex, then the, the, you, can, you can make a graphic in this way. You have, you have different, you have monkeys in the, in, the, in, the, in the forest. These monkeys only can jump, let's say, 10 meters away. So they can jump, if they are producing flowers, produce avocados, and then later more capacity will produce more. But if this monkey wants to produce, wants to, an industrial nanotechnology will fail. Every, all the resources, all the effort will be absolutely lost. So it has to be very realistic. And I think you already have a great capacity in Eastern Africa, so don't forget that. So build on all your strengths. Okay, so my time is running out, but I actually want to quite happy with, uh, with this exchange. This is essentially what needs to happen. Um, but uh, uh, let me just go on with the dangers of, of uh, what is happening in hyper-competitive markets and how it reflects cities and how it can reflect cities. So, uh, Detroit, home of automobile industry, uh, Henry Ford introduced, uh, brought up production on a completely new level by introducing assembly uh, uh, lines. So the city prospered, it had everything, culture, uh, uh, production, jobs, um, um, everything. Uh, it got to 1.5 million people by 1930. Um, so, how it looks today? Well, this is not the whole city. I took up some pictures that show how parts of the city are actually devastated. They have 70,000 empty buildings in the city. It's ruined. They even have rabbit dogs running around, unchecked. Nobody's taking care of them. It's a very, very sad story. And it's a story of effective global competition and probably inability of management of the city to, to see where things are going and to adapt, to align. They lost jobs. If they lost jobs, what, are they, what will people do? They leave. And what happened is they got from 1.8 million in 1950 to 1,700,000 to people today. That's a uh, Serious decline. Serious decline. And 25 of its population, 25%, uh, uh, they lost in basically first 10 years of this uh, century. In 10 years. So that was massive exodus. So uh, Henry Ford said, uh, said if, you, if I had asked people what they wanted, they would have said faster horses. Apparently, management of the city of Detroit didn't listen. They kept things as they usually were handled, and they didn't take into consideration changing environment. They didn't adapt, and the consequences are like that. I will come back to Detroit later. So, when we talk about uh, innovation, it's, it's a very, very... Uh, increasingly important, uh, important word, but uh, basically the concept. Innovation is more like a way of thinking rather than invention, uh, a product or a service uh, per se. 
It's much broader than that. You can innovate everywhere, in management, in, in branding, in, in uh, um, literally everything, in education, in, in whatever you want, really. It's about, uh, 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 Schumpeter uh, defined it as a creative destruction where entrepreneurs combine existing elements in new ways. Exactly what uh, we're talking, uh, you were talking just, just now. Some things are already there, technologies are already there, you just need to combine it in a new way. Which is also what Henry Ford said. He didn't invent anything new, he just took what already existed and combined it in a different way. So you don't have to be top level researchers, you have to be creative to combine in a different way, to, to address with what already exists, to address new areas or new problems with what you have at your disposal. That's as important aspect of innovation as creating completely new products or services. Well, recently, <coughs> Brookings Institute published this paper. It's called uh, The Rise of Innovation District. It's a new geography of innovation in America. It basically talks about how cities are approaching uh, developments of, of uh, well, cities in a completely new way. And they also claim it's not uh, 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 a result of a policy. It just happened. It seemed natural for this to happen. And basically, uh, um, what we're talking about is that uh, its utilization of different partners, stakeholders, like uh, business, university, civil society, government, to work together around uh, 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 same goals, to develop locations around uh, very targeted uh, ideas around, around um, and to utilize basically what they uh, uh, identify as their um, uh, biggest potential. So basically job creation and innovation can be fostered through, through intentional clustering of businesses, institutions, ideas and people. It is possible and of course we discussed just before, the context is different for every city. And that has to be very clear. So your situation is not nearly the same uh, uh, as, as that in, in Tokyo or New York. It's not the same. So I will skip through a couple of slides. There are some examples. I will stop uh, because uh, the time is really running out now. Um, well, Seattle is another example of how uh, a city can actually have a jump start if properly, if, if some issues are properly addressed. This is in 1970s. Uh, it was uh, also serious decline uh, of, of, of city of Seattle. And today, they're like 25% above the average per capita income, and productivity is 37% above the average. They focus on attracting talent in institutions and people. People are the biggest value. They, they generate value. Maybe a, a short example on why I firmly am really believe in that. Uh, Africa is a resource-rich country. You have everything. And the poorest area of the world by far. Japan has no resources. Only people. Up to recently, probably the third biggest economy in the world. So. It's very, in my opinion, very important point. So, in, in following uh, presentations, you will hear more about technology parks and incubators. I just wanted to say that in European Union, uh, as an example, there are 10,000 business uh, incubators and innovation centers already existing. News are being built. No, not, not news, but new ones are being built. <coughs> So if you take a look, these are competitive clusters, and it's just basically about pinpointing uh, the focal, uh, the focal uh, focus uh, area. Uh, some are focusing on automotive, uh, financial services, some are focused on food, aerospace, wine, financial services. These are areas that uh, cities uh, uh, can focus and create clusters around it. But the problem for Europe is that if you have uh, so many of them, how do you coordinate? How do you avoid competition, internal competition, and create uh, synergies between them? 
in the end it's one economic area. And the Commission does not want to invest in one center that will compete in the other center that they're financing as well. What they want uh, is that them working together uh, to, to create additional value and be more competitive on a global scale in comparison to US, in comparison to Japan, other parts of the world. So this is why one of the policy instruments the, the Commission actually is pushing forward is uh, a smart specialization strategy. Each country in Europe has an obligation to draft smart specialization strategy. And that is exactly uh, uh, the strategic doc uh, document that uh, you should also consider. Not maybe in form of smart specialization, in some other form, but the, 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 the point, the essence of what this document does is what I believe uh, you uh, would be also should be interested in. It's basically about selecting areas where you can actually have best competitive advantage and areas around which you can build your own human resources to gain advantage on a global scale. First on the regional, then bring it to the global. Remember, again, just as a reminder, we are talking about processes, 15, 20, 30 years. It will not happen overnight. You have to continuously invest, and that's why policy in this uh, 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 sense is extremely, extremely important. And that's exactly uh, what... <coughs> It all, it all comes down from vision, and uh, these are all elements that have to integrate into a broader vision of what you want to achieve. Then design strategies around it. Strategies, in my opinion, are not documents. Strategies are processes which get documented at one point in time. You simply write down what you discussed and what you decided you will do in the following period. But they cannot be fixed. They are not written in stone. Exactly because knowledge and technologies are so rapidly emerging, new ones. They can change patterns of behavior of everybody overnight. Just remember Facebook, or before you had a typewriter, then somebody invented PC. It changed the complete way how our office work is organized. It's basically disruption in, 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 in this sense, and uh, um, yeah. But the, all of this has to be also governed. So you have to continuously have a, a, a keep an eye on what your assets are. Are they developing? How do you want to develop them further? What are the actors? Do you have all of them? Do you want to bring new ones? All aiming at a, a broader goal and broader agenda. And of course, you design activities around it. But what is important is uh, you have to have uh, this uh, broader management. You have to manage the context. Otherwise, uh, you will have what I said in the beginning. One ministry goes that way, the other ministry goes this way. And then instead of uh, providing solutions, uh, you are having uh, conflicts and clashes. Extremely important is to pinpoint where your sweet spot is. That you do by analysis what uh, your customers, depending on what your type of your organization is, what your, what, who are your customers, what others uh, in, in uh, the area that you're covering are doing, uh, so what are other uh, competitors in this case, and uh, what are your uh, own region's assets and capabilities. Out of this, you can actually get to a sweet spot, and that's essentially the process that identifies where you have best chance to utilize your potential. This is a matter of deep analysis. We cannot uh, determine this uh, here. It's, it's, a, it's a process and it requires some effort. And then there are a number of uh, technology science parts. I will go through, through some of them, maybe stop uh, at Detroit, of course. Uh, but what I wanted to do first is, uh, uh, Silicon Valley is, uh, of course, uh, well, very successful. One of the reasons why it's so successful is uh, because there is so many uh, companies and people in some so small space. So it's like, uh, let's say, physics. If you put lots of particles in a small space, they are bound to collide. And collision uh, uh, creates uh, some sort of reaction. Same in business. People talk, they get new ideas launch new companies, employ new people, because it's not only company, well, companies discussing, it's also employees discussing among each other. And they see what his company is actually not good at. And then he finds a partner, a guy who's doing another company that sees what they're not doing, they come together, develop, uh, uh, spin out a new company. Boston Innovation <coughs> Districts is one uh, great example. Uh, Barcelona, another one, uh, you may know, you may know uh, uh, when Barcelona 
at 22 uh, was uh, launched. Uh, Mr. Klaus was uh, uh, mayor then. So uh, I need to hurry. I've been heard before. <laughs> so Brainport, Eindhoven, in, co uh, in combination with uh, Philips, uh, created a very interesting place. And the name is indicative. It's Brainport. They bring brains into the area. And Detroit, now there is a solution for the problem. And they're already doing it. So what they want to do is, uh, uh, well, mainly what we've discussed so far. So they are combining all these elements. And what I wanted to show is, uh, is, uh, is uh, these two pictures. Like they are trying to, uh, to compete as a region, to bring more resources in. So they are basically fragmenting a bit and having these nodes in the cities. As I understand, similar situation is going to be in Nairobi. You will have many more districts that will have to be developed. Some of them are uh, possible to, to create as an innovation district. Some of them are not. It's a matter of assessment. But if you look at it in this way, you may, you may actually find new opportunities. Not only in railway uh, uh, city, maybe some other uh, areas as well. So I will skip that one and that one and move to final 40 seconds. Uh, I hope this will work now. Because... Okay. Innovation shifting. To find innovation coming 20 years ago, a worker needed to drive to a secluded research park, work in isolation, and keep ideas secret. Today, proximity is everything. Workers want to be in urban places that are walkable, bikeable, hyper caffeinated, where they can bump into other workers and share ideas. Firms also want to be close to other firms, research labs, and universities in collaborative spaces so that smart ideas can be turned into smart products for the market. Innovation districts are this century's productive geography. They are both competitive places and cool spaces, and they will transform your city and the tropics. Thanks. Oh, that's it. So, thank you very much.